Good evening. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2022 Lactose Award Lecture. I'm Hasek Chan from the Department of History and Philosophy of Science at the University of Cambridge. It's my great pleasure and honor to chair the proceedings this evening, which is really because Roman Frigg, who is the chair of the Lactose Award Management Committee, is on leave this year, and um, he's not in London, so he sends his apologies. So I, I'm chairing this on behalf of the whole management committee, uh, of which I am a member. And today we are celebrating the work of Professor Katarina Dutier Novais, who is a full professor in the Department of Philosophy at the Freie Universität Amsterdam, the Free University of Amsterdam. And this is the last time I'm going to attempt to pronounce anything in Dutch, so <laughs> be assured. And I'll come to the award-winning book in just a moment, but let me just give a brief introduction of Professor Dutier Novais's career uh, path. She studied uh, philosophy and mathematics as an undergraduate student at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, and then came to the Netherlands, uh, took her master's in logic at the Institute for Logic, Language, and Computation at the University of Amsterdam, and then moved on to Leiden University, where she did her PhD in the history and philosophy of logic, which uh, very much started off the line of work which ended in the prize-winning book today. So that PhD was in 2006, and so you can see how long she has been working on this. She is truly a citizen of the world, growing up in Brazil and France, and doing her academic training and work in the Netherlands and the United States as well. I'm not going to go through all of her numerous publications because that will take up the entire evening, but let me just note a few things. Uh, there's a book, Formalizing Medieval Logical Theories, 2007, published by Springer, which was followed by Formal Languages in Logic, a Philosophical and Cognitive Analysis, which was published by Cambridge in 2012. And then there's also a book edited by, uh, co-edited with Stephen Reed, uh, The Cambridge Companion to Medieval Logic. And of course, today's uh, book we're celebrating. Um, she has published more than 70 papers, I think. I, I didn't try to count precisely. On a whole range of subjects, going from Carnapian explication and ameliorative analysis to pornography, ideology, and propaganda, and everything in between. The work we are celebrating today is the book, The Dialogical Roots of Deduction, Historical, Cognitive and Philosophical Perspectives on Reasoning, published again by Cambridge University Press in 2020. Now, the actual award will be presented at the reception after the lecture to which everyone is invited. Um, but I'll just say a few quick words about the book right now, and then um, I'll be saying a few more words about, about it um, at the reception. So the Lakatos Award, as you all know, is named in honor of Imre Lakatos, whose centenary of birth we celebrated last year, um, among other things, with a nice workshop here at the LSE in November. The Lakatos Award has been given since 1986, and it is certainly the most coveted and authoritative book prize that there is in the philosophy of science. For a long time, it was the only book prize that we had in the field. Now there's more, but this is still the one we want to get. <laughs> I believe that Katerina's book is the first ever winner of the Lakatos Prize 
that is in the area of the philosophy of logic. Uh, I may be wrong, but I think I am right. There have been a few in the philosophy of mathematics, but not in logic. And this is not because the people who give the Lakatos Award think that logic is not a worthy subject, but because it is supposed to be a prize in the philosophy of science, and very often we can't see the direct link between work in philosophy of logic and the philosophy of science. And Katarina's book is, I think, the first one that broke through that barrier and convinced the selectors and the management committee that it is very pertinent to philosophy of science. I think of it as a book that offers an understanding of logic and of uh, the mathematical sciences as well uh, in terms of what does and should happen in actual practices of reasoning. And I think this is what we're going to hear about in her um, award lecture in just a moment. I want to just quote a brief sentence from Katharina's website, which says, philosophy is the place where all disciplines meet. And I think she has certainly put that idea into practice in this book. We have everything from the history of logic in ancient Greece and in other cultural traditions. We have reflections on the nature of mathematical practices right up to today. We have evidence of her ideas about the nature of reasoning taken from biology, from psychology, from cultural evolution, from neuroscience, from all kinds of diverse areas of human intellectual endeavor. So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce to you Professor Katerina dutir novais and uh, welcome her to the stage to deliver her Lakatos Award Lecture 2022. Thank you. Thank you, Hasok. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, yes, well, I'm uh, you know, very excited. This was something, as you said, it's the prize we all want to win. And I was hoping I would win it, but I also thought, well, it's a long shot. There are many other good books around. And, uh, well, perhaps I could start with this very small anecdote. I got this email from Roman Freak, and the title was Lakatos Award, and I was alone at home. And I thought he's going to say I was nominated, or I don't know, I did, somehow it didn't occur to me immediately that it would already be the email telling me that I had won. And I was alone at home and I started screaming and jumping. <laughs> and uh, yeah, nobody was there to, uh, except for the cat to confirm, but that's, that's how happy I was. And uh, well, anyway, uh, let's see if this works. Mm, now it doesn't work. It was working just now. Am I doing something wrong? This, is this off? Yeah, otherwise I'll just use the... Okay, that's okay, thank you. All right, so The Dialogical Roots of Deduction, that's the title of the book. This is the cover of the book, you'll see it again in a minute. Um, no, this, yes. So very briefly, Hasag already uh, mentioned a bit what the book is about. Perhaps some of you have even read the book already or are at least familiar with it a little bit. So the idea the, uh, is to offer an overarching conceptualization of deduction as a dialogical practice. So this is the core idea of the whole book. And the main thesis is that deduction has dialogical roots and that these dialogical roots are still present in the theories and practices of deduction, even though I also say in the book that non-dialogical features were picked up along the way, historically speaking. And, and I see the book as an exercise of what I now like to call synthetic philosophy. I don't know if my friend Eric Schlisser is here. Uh, uh, yes, there he is, so uh, I borrow the term from. And uh, so the idea is really to bring together many different uh, uh, perspectives from different uh, intellectual traditions and different disciplines and try to kind of all make, you know, construct this grand narrative where the different pieces 
uh, fit together. So indeed, there is philosophy in the book, there's history, there's psychology and cognitive science, and there's mathematics education and mathematical practice. These are the main areas that I bring together. And some other, a little bit of biology here as well. So uh, yeah, so that's, that's a project of synthetic philosophy as I see it. And the, another uh, important feature of the book is that it highlights the human and, in fact, social nature of deduction as something that is embedded in actual human practices. And, and for me, this is very important because pretty much all of this is my whole take on philosophy. So I'm mostly interested in what I call the human factor. So I try to connect philosophical questions, ph typical philosophical topics, to how things are done. So in a way, you could say I'm a pragmatist. In fact, this has been said. So very much the, the concern with practices, with actual uh, human uh, activities. Okay. So this is the, the book has three parts. Uh, the first part is a more philosophical part, and it has four chapters. Then there's the second part, is the historical part, with three chapters. And at the end, there are four chapters, three of which engage with empirical findings on human cognition, coming from cognitive science, psychology, also mathematics education. And then there's the last chapter on mathematical practices. And this is the cover of the book, as you uh, will have seen already. And uh, the painting that is on the cover is by the Dutch painter Vincent van Gogh, Van Gogh. Perhaps that, that's more familiar. And I've always thought, I always liked this painting very much, and I always thought that I would like this painting to be, uh, you know, if I were to write the book, which I had intended to, to have it on the cover of the book. And this worked out, and just on the day, or pretty much on the day that I got the proofs for the cover, uh, there, was, there, were, there was big news in the art history world. They had found the exact spot where Van Gogh, Van Gogh, had painted that particular painting. And this was also the very last painting that he made. So just you know, a bit of background. And I am, uh, yeah, of course, trees and, and roots and all that. OK, so the, the book, of course, I couldn't talk about the whole book in a, in a short lecture. In fact, I have done that a few times. But <laughs> I decided to uh, today focus on a few topics from the book. Uh, and this is, this is what I chose. So, and again, the, my emphasis here will be to try to connect deduction to actual human practices, right? So this is the guiding line, the guiding thought, why these topics from the book. So I start with the history, uh, the dialogical root of, roots of deduction in ancient Greece. Then I, of course, talk about Lakatos. How could I not? <laughs> and so the Lakatosian background, which inspires the book. Then I talk about the prover skeptic model, which is the main kind of conceptual uh, development in the book, which then guides the investigation throughout. And then finally, I spend a bit more time talking about uh, provers and skeptics in mathematical practice, as ma in, ma in how mathematics, uh, research in mathematics is done as of today. Okay? So this way you see many ways in which my idea connects to actual practices with you know, things that people do to make it, kind of just, you know, say it in more plain words. Right, so I'll start with the historical bit. And in the book itself, the historical part is the second part. So I, in the book, I made the choice of starting with the philosophical part. But actually, in terms of the genesis of my ideas, uh, you could say the context of discovery of the <laughs> ideas in the book, the, the historical um, components were really what inspired me to start this whole research project in the first place. So the history is really kind of, at, for me at least, in terms of my thinking on these matters, that's, that, that's what's at the root. So that's why I thought maybe I'll just run the context of discovery here today and then start with the historical development. So the dialogical roots of deduction in ancient Greece. So this is the, the idea is, and this is not an idea that I myself came up with, but there's this, this work by uh, historians and classicists, for example, uh, Jeffrey Lloyd and also Ravi Onets. There, there are other uh, uh, people who have argued that it's very important to think about the broader cultural, political, and social context 
of, say, in ancient Greece to understand how, why the, the particular ways of doing science, of doing mathematics, of doing philosophy that emerged in that context, why, how they were related to these kind of broader contextual elements, right, societal elements. And the thought is that, well, the key idea is the, the idea of Athenian democracy uh, and the idea, right, so Athens was a democracy, of course, in a different way from how we now understand democracy, but in any case, it's thought to be uh, perhaps the first, uh, uh, you know, organized democratic system in history. And, and what's important is to keep in mind that in, the, in this context of Athenian democracy, there, the, the, the debates were extremely important, discussions, in particular in the assembly, which was the main political body, right, so where people kind of proposed things and then the others voted, and also only the citizens, of course, and women were not citizens, slaves were not citizens, so there were all these limitations, but otherwise uh, anyone who was considered to be a citizen in Athens could participate in these debates and vote. And the other thing that's also very interesting, which I only found out as I was already working on this project, is that uh, the, in, the, in a court of law, then in Athens, uh, it wasn't allowed for you to hire somebody to plead for you. So the idea of lawyers who would be, you know, pleading your cause on your behalf, this wasn't really allowed. So that's why everybody had to be, a, uh, citizens had to be good orators in case they were, you know, they were accused of some crime and had to go and defend themselves <laughs> in a court of law. So that's why it was very significant to be a good orator, not just for political reasons, but also for legal reasons. So this was very important for, for citizens in this context. And, and, and the, the, these debates took place very much in, a, in what we could describe as a polemical background. Right? So there was very much this idea of orators made speeches for or against different positions. And the votes were yes or no, they were binary, right? We logicians would say binary votes, it's just two options. And the other thing that was interesting is that the voting took place immediately after the speeches. So there was no point for now, we, you know, we know from our notion of deliberative democracy now that often people then discuss with each other and you know, there's more room for kind of an evaluation of the different positions. No, it was immediately after the speeches that people had to vote. That means, again, you had to be extremely persuasive. Right? It was very important to be extremely uh, good at causing an impression on people. And so this ability of you know, being a good orator was very important. How does one learn to do this in this context? Well, there were those people who offered their services uh, to teach young citizens to the, the art of rhetoric and oratory. And these were very often the ones that now history has preserved under the name of the sophists. So probably those of you who uh, you know, have had some uh, exposure to, to ancient Greek philosophy at some point, you remember the sophists, they had a very, uh, at least Plato and Aristotle, they spoke very badly of those people, of <laughs> course. But in recent years, recent decades even, there's been a whole reappraisal of the sophists as philosophers. Okay, uh, but so they were, they were they, but they, it is true that they very much focused on how to teach rhetorical skills to citizens so that these citizens could influence other citizens in these political gatherings. Right? So very much this kind of de uh, uh, debating background. So this was at the height of what the so-called the golden age of the Athenian democracy. But some of you will remember things didn't always go very well at some point. There was this war, there were these wars, these series of wars between Athens and Sparta, which are known as the Peloponnesian Wars, and this very much led to the decline of Athenian democracy. And Plato was born precisely around the time of the first Peloponnesian Wars. And so perhaps you remember, you remember from the Republic, from other texts by Plato, Plato was very critical of democracy. Right? He thought that actually it didn't work as a system. And he and others, but of course, he, for posterity, we mostly associate this position with Plato. Uh, the, he uh, attributed everything that was wrong with democracy, with Athenian democracy, to the sophists, <laughs> to their over <laughs> excessive focus on persuasion. Right? So they, he and Aristotle and, and Socrates, as you know, the, as portrayed in, in Plato's dialogues, they were very critical 
right, of the way the sophists thought about debating about discourse more generally. And they represent everything that was wrong with democracy. Okay? So this is kind of the historical, intellectual, cultural background. And here, of course, this very famous painting, or presumably of the Academy, with Aristotle pointing upwards, sorry, Plato pointing upwards to the sky, and, uh, and Aristotle next to him, allegedly. <laughs> so in this context, so you had uh, people like Socrates and Plato criticizing the sophists and looking for a different model of intellectual inquiry. What they thought was wrong with the sophists is that they had no commitment to the idea of truth. Right? So I'd, famously, the sophists could argue for A or for not A, depending on who would pay more. <laughs> right? and, uh, and so that then that what it was viewed as, uh, as you know, a lack of commitment to, to, to the truth. And so, so there's like, traditionally the historiography of the philosophy of this period, there's very, very much this emphasis between, on the one hand, persuasion with the sophists, and on the other hand, truth with Aristotle and Plato and Socrates. But I and others, well, others have argued before me, I think this is the wrong way to think about the realm of possibilities here because they, I don't think that what they were saying, Plato and Aristotle and Socrates, uh, they weren't saying we have to aim at truth instead of persuasion. No, I think that they were aiming at truth, truth with persuasion. So the whole idea, they obviously they didn't have the luxury of not caring anymore about persuasion because they were still in the situation of Athenian democracy where persuasion was still very, very important. So the, the, the thought is that you know, if you look, uh, if you read Plato and Aristotle in this way, you see that persuasion remains important to them. Okay? And this is very much why one of the sources of inspiration for me to think about logic in this dialogical way. And in particular, was something that uh, those of you who have read Plato, and I hope if you haven't, you should, it's one of the greatest pleasures in life. I often say if I could start over again, I would become a Plato scholar and spend the rest of my life just reading Plato and writing about Plato because it's, it's, it's very, very beautiful and rewarding. But anyway, from Plato's dialogues, uh, there's this model of inquiry which became known as dialectic, in particular Socratic dialectic. Uh, there's like later Platonic dialectic is a different thing, but the earlier Socratic mode of dialectic is this idea of these dialogical interactions where speakers take turns in quick su succession. And this contrasted with the long speeches of the sophists. Right? So the sophists, they gave long speeches, and they also, this was also criticized by somebody like Socrates. He said, no, you need you know, the, the, the dialectical model of, of interaction where people take turns qu in quick succession. That's better in terms of seeking the truth. There are many passages where he says some things along these lines. And the Elenchus, yeah, so that the Elenchus is refutation. What is a Socratic refutation? This is something that you see in many of Plato's dialogues. So what Socrates is doing is, is asking questions. He's talking to somebody and then asking questions and getting the interlocutor to commit to certain positions and then showing that if you put all these different things that the interlocutor has granted together, it's in, uh, the, the set of commitments is incoherent. Right? There are internal tensions between the different commitments. And that leads, so this is an, an embarrassment, right? So in fact, the etymology of elenchus is related to shame. So you know, if you've been refuted, right? I mean, you should feel shame. But actually, this is also what will allow you to cleanse your soul from false beliefs, right? So there's this whole idea that you actually need the shock of going through a refutation of being shamed in this way. But what's really important is that Socrates doesn't tell you which one of the beliefs of the, the commitments that you made before should be the one that you will revise. This is still something you should do. Socrates just shows that taken together, they're incoherent. And what's really important here for, this, for the history of logic, as I see it, as I argue in the book, is that there's an implicit notion of implication that is at work here in the practice of Elenchus. Because somebody, suppose like so, Socrates' interlocutors says, uh, Socrates says, do you agree with P? Yes, I agree with P, I grant you P. Then also Socrates says, 
Do you, uh, do, you, do you agree with Q? Yes, I also agree with Q. And also with R? Yes, I do. But then Socrates says, but wait, Q and R together imply not P. And since you also granted P, now you have an incoherent set of commitments. And what's interesting here is that there is this notion of implication, right? That is implicitly there already. And this is where I argue in the book, and others have argued along similar lines, this is what motivates Aristotle to develop syllogistic, which is the first formal system of logic. Right? Because you needed some sort of regimented notion of what implies what. And I argue in the book that this comes very much from this practice of elenchus, which in turn is dialogical. Right? So this is one of the ways in which I argue for the importance of thinking about logic in this dialogical, in this dialogical way. And just, I'm not going to say much about Aristotle, but very briefly. So Aristotle and the Prionalytics, people know the Prionalytics, mostly the first chapters, which are you know, very nice because there's like this kind of meta perspective on which syllogisms are valid or not. This is just in the first chapters, and then the rest of the, of the Prionalytics is all about how you apply the system of syllogistic to actual dialectical situations. So he's still very much interested in the practices of dialectic in the Prionalytics. It's just that most people only read the first chapters, <laughs> right, where the nice formal system is presented, and then the rest, they forget about the rest. Whereas me and my team back in the, when I was still at the University of Groningen running this project, we read all of it together, you know, very diligently. In fact, there, we read all of the Prionalytics, we read all of the Gorgias, and then a third book that we read in its entirety. Can you guess? Proofs and Refutations <laughs> by Lakatos. So, you know, Lakatos was all up there together with Plato and Aristotle. Okay, so this is on the philosophy side, right, so uh, dialectic. But a very similar story is also happening in Greek mathematics, and it's not a coincidence because the mathematicians, the philosophers, they're all the same people, and they were all hanging out together anyway. So there isn't a sharp distinction. Aristotle was very much inspired by mathematics. Uh, Plato said you can only enter the academy if you know geometry. So of course the connections were there all along. And this, is a, this was a very important also source of inspiration for me when I started working on this project is the work of Ravi Onets. In particular his book called The Shaping of Deduction which is still, even though it was published more than 20 years ago, still the most comprehensive account of the history the historical emergence of deduction in, in ancient Greece. And in the book, at some point towards the end of the book, he says something that absolutely summarizes what I was trying to do with my research project and then ended up uh, being uh, uh, reflected in the whole of my book, The Dialogical Roots of Deduction. And he says the following. Greek mathematics reflects the importance of persuasion. It reflects the role of orality in the use of formulae in the structure of proofs. But this orality is regimented into written form, where vocabulary is limited, presentations follow a relatively rigid pattern. And now comes the slogan, it is at once oral and written. And this really summarizes the whole book. And where I want to say is that on the one hand there are these dialogical roots of deduction, but along the way many non-dialogical elements were picked up as well, in particular with respect to notations, with respect to writing. And my previous book, Formal Languages and Logic, was very much about that part, right? about the writing of mathematics. Okay, so this is how you see how the different things are connected. So that's from Greek mathematics. So, uh, I, yeah, I'm gonna, this is it for the historical part. I'm uh, happy to take more questions on the mathematics part. I was a bit brief on that, but it's also very interesting. And today uh, we had the expert workshop, and then Wesley, where is Wesley? Yeah, yes, I was talking about Euclid, so you see that there's a lot, a lot of interesting stuff. And he also had some difficult questions for me, things he didn't quite agree on, so <laughs> there's lots to talk about. So now I move on, fast forward many centuries to the future, to the 20th century, we look at this. So this is Proofs and Refutations, a very famous cover. You see it, I was just at the department today of the LSC and it's hanging there. Proofs of Refutations, for those of you who don't know, uh, was a pu pu book published posthumously right after uh, Lakatos died, but it was, it was drawing on, first of all, his PhD dissertation, which I think was defended in 59. Yes, I don't, um, thereabouts. And then articles that he published in the meantime, and then eventually 
it got published in a book form as Proofs and Refutations, which was published, by the way, in 76, which happens to be the year I was born. So somehow there's, there must be some cosmical connection between these things. Anyway, in the book, there's this classroom dialogue between a teacher and students. And they're discussing various attempted proofs of Euler's conjecture for polyedra, right? Polyedra are things like this one, like, like these funny shapes with a you know, with vertices, edges, and faces. That's the whole point. And the conjecture says that there is this connection between the vertices, edges, and faces of the polyedra, of all polyedra through this formula. All of them, that's the conjecture, satisfy this formula. V minus E plus F equals 2. Okay, so that's the conjecture. And then the teacher presents an argument supporting the conjecture, which is due to Cauchy. And that's the proofs side of it, right? Because there's the title, Proofs on Refutation. So the proof side of it is what this conjecture is put forward. But what happens then as the dialogue progresses is that the students, they scrutinize and criticize the argument. They come up with refutations, with counterexamples. So that's, and then every time that they come up with a counterexample, well, we then we need to change the initial, the proof as it was initially proposed. And so this is how the, the, the whole dialogue develops by means of, through the dialectic of proofs and refutations, right? This is the idea. And at each objection, right, so the proof is modified and adjusted. And this is Lakatos' account of how mathematical knowledge is produced, right? It's not the idea of co-creation uh, between, through the dynamics, through the dialectic between proofs and refutations. And what's in the background is actually Hegel a Hegelian account of mathematics. So I just finished uh, so, uh, a paper for the centenary volume that's being edited on Lakatos, and where I argue precisely that you know, the, what, what Lakatos was really interested in was actually the ideas. Right? So the protagonists of the book are not the characters, that they are the ideas, the mathematical concepts. So he's primarily interested in concepts, not in people. So there, there's a big difference between Lakatos and me, and I talk about this in, the, in this particular paper that I just recently uh, wrote. And so, so in that sense, there's this difference, but this idea of the uh, interaction, this dialogical interaction between different sides and somebody putting forward a proof or conjecture or an argument and this in turn being scrutinized, criticized, that's very much at the, at the origin conceptually also of what I say in the book. And there's one, uh, the book is also really, really fun to read, I recommend. And, uh, and uh, there's one particular passage which I think is priceless. So there's this idea of what I, and now it's a term that's also used in the social sciences, the idea of adversarial collaboration, right? Where people are actually collaborating with each other by, by being very critical, by adopting this kind of very critical stance. And I, I really see this in, uh, in this particular passage from Proofs and Refutations. So one of the students says, Sigma says, then not only do refutations act as fermenting agents for proof analogy, analysis, but proof analysis may act as a fermer, fermer, fermenting, oh, sorry, fermenting agent for refutations. What an unholy alliance between seeming enemies. Right? Very dramatic. So it looks like they're enemies, but actually they're collaborating. And this is very much, this is, this is one of the key ideas that I went on to develop in the book. Okay. So I don't, I, I, I'm a, I'm a, my story is a, is a form of dialogical pragmatism, whereas uh, uh, Lakatos', Lakatos philosophy of mathematics is Hegelian idealism. So in that sense, we very much disagree, but in many other things, we agree. Okay, so this, this is already gives you kind of the conceptual background so that I can introduce the main uh, conceptual framework that I develop in the, first I develop in the first chapters, in chapter three in particular, and then I go on and apply it throughout the book. So it's really kind of the, the guiding principle throughout the book, the prover skeptic model. So I start this already in chapter one with the observation that there are three main features of, the, of deductive arguments. And these are truth, necessary truth preservation, and this is, this is the one that's most widely associated with deductive arguments. So it's the idea that a deductive argument has to be like this knockdown argument. There are no exceptions, no possible objections. So, right, so the example I start the book with is so suppose you have this argument that says all dogs are mortal, Fido is a dog, therefore Fido is mortal. 
Right? This is a deductive argument. Why? Because there's no way in which, if the premises are true, the conclusion could be false. So, right, so, and, and even if you love Fido very much, you would like Fido not to die. But still, if the premises are true, the, the sad conclusion will be that Fido is mortal. Okay? So this is a, a deductive argument. So there's no uh, counterexamples to this. Are you not going to find uh, something that satisfies the premises and then it's, it's going to falsify the conclusion? And, and so this idea of argument, deductive arguments are indefeasible. And this is very much, this is a property of deductive arguments that's widely recognized, okay? But then there are two other properties that I think are also very important, but are not exclusive to deductive arguments, and this is why I think they tend to be overlooked. But you really need to take them into account as well if you're uh, trying to give a philosophical account of deduction. And these are, I call them the first one, one is uh, called, I call it perspicuity, so the idea that a deductive argument has to proceed in a stepwise way and each of the steps has to be sufficiently clear, okay? So if you go, you take like this complex uh, mathematical theorem, I just state the premises and I go st straight to the conclusion, it's truth preserving, you cannot find a counterexample, but nobody's gonna say that this is a good mathematical proof. In fact, they're not gonna say it is a mathematical proof at all, okay? And what I emphasize is this idea of perspicuity that is related very much to the explanatory role of proofs, right? They intend not only to elicit persuasion, but also a specific kind of persuasion, namely explanatory persuasion. And there's a whole discussion on mathematicians preferring proofs that are explanatory over proofs that are not. You can talk about it if people are interested. And what I emphasize is that this perspicuity uh, feature has to do, is very much related to the idea of cooperation. Right? That, that the proof is a piece of discourse which uh, fosters a cooperation between the person putting forth the proof and the person receiving the proof. Okay? Whereas necessary truth preservation is much more associated with the adversarial aspect of me trying to find a counterexample to knock down your proof. Okay? As you know, and then going back to, oh no, sorry, I can't go back, yeah. Oh, okay, can I? Yes, to Lakatos, right? An unholy alliance of seeming enemies. Right? So it seems like when you're criticizing a proof, finding counterexamples, finding problems with it, that you're being adversarial with each other, but in a way you're actually cooperating. And then finally, there's this property of belief bracketing, which means basically that you know, in its simplest form, if you're doing deductive reasoning, you should be able to draw conclusions from premises even if you don't believe the premises, if, you're not, if you don't find them compelling, okay? So you should be able, and then I say this, you know, the dialogical story for this is that you should be able to draw conclusions from somebody else's commitments, right? And in practice, this is not even very mysterious, right? So in a, for example, in a, in a court of law, right, so there's prosecution and defense, and then one way in which prosecution could argue against defense is say, well, assuming that this and this and this is true, what you're saying, then something very strange follows, so some contradiction. So, so in this way, right, it's not so much that I'm endorsing these premises, I'm drawing the conclusions from somebody else's uh, commitments, which is very much what Socrates was already doing, as I mentioned. And so this is the idea of perspective shifts, that you should be able also to draw conclusions from somebody else's beliefs, somebody else's discursive commitments. And you might think, what's the big deal with that? As it turns out, this is cognitively very difficult. Right? There are many, there's a lot of experimental work showing, showing that people find this very difficult to do, okay? So these three, these three concepts, that they, I call them the three cornerstones of deduction. And thinking about, and this I'm not, you know, I'm not inventing this. I just took this also from this kind of manual for teach mathematics teachers I think it was in the United States, but it could have been anywhere else. So I say, well, what is a proof? A proof is you know, something that has exactly these three properties. At the very beginning of the book, I mentioned this. So this, this is, the, so we want to account for these three conceptual pillars, right, of the concept of deduction. How do we do this? This is where the prover skeptic dialogues come in. And they're, of course, inspired by the dialectic of proofs and refutations from uh, uh, from by, by, proposed by Lakatos, but I, I, I modified the Lakatosian ideas. 
So uh, my dialogues are between a prover and a skeptic. So I call like the, the, the critic is I call it a skeptic. And a skeptic, by the way, uh, etymologically, in you know the, the Greek origin of the term, skeptic is just the, the somebody who makes inquiries. It's just somebody who asks questions. Not necessarily somebody who doesn't believe anything, right? We often associate the idea of skepticism with the idea of uh, I don't know anything. But that's not that's not what is meant here. It's just somebody who asks questions, a lot of questions even. <laughs> uh, and so the, these, these dialogues are meant as a rational reconstruction of what, you know, of deductive arguments. Uh, I'm happy to clarify what I mean by rational reconstruction if anyone is interested at Q&A in a minute. And the whole story, the, the, these dialogues, they start when Prover states the theorem to be, to be proved and then ask skeptics, skeptic to grant certain premises. And once this happens, then Prover proceeds to establish the conclusion in a stepwise way, right? Breaking it, the argument down into uh, steps which are individually, presumably, convincing. And what does skeptic do? There are three main move for, moves for skeptic, and these three main moves, they mirror exactly the three main conceptual pillars of deduction that I mentioned. So one of them is to come up with counterexamples. That's the one we also know from Lakatos. And that one has to do with the property of necessary truth preservation. Right? So this is the, the, the conceptual um, um, counterpart uh, in the prover skeptic dialogues of the proof of the property of necessary truth preservation. Then there is the, the move of asking for further clarifications. I'd ask you for why does this follow? Why is this, you know, what's going on? This step is going too quickly for me. And this, of course, is the mirror property of uh, perspicuity, right? You want the proof to be uh, clear all along. And then there's the third possible move for skeptic, which is to grant or deny premises. And that, of course, has to do with the belief bracketing property, right? That you need to be able to reason with premises even if you participate Personally, you don't endorse them, okay? And so what go, what's happening in this dialogue, uh, I hope it's clear by now, is that there's some amount of adversariality, right, in the sense that you want to be kind of critical, but by and large, these two people, prover and skeptic, they're cooperating with each other, right, to produce a good mathematical proof and to produce mathematical knowledge, okay? So that's, that's the idea here. And this is where my proposal differs from other dialogical proposals of logic, uh, accounts of logic that have been proposed in the literature by people like Lawrence and, and Hintika. And the difference is that they very much focused only on the adversarial side of these dialogues, whereas I also emphasize the cooperative side, okay? So this gives you this kind of tree, the, the flow chart for these dialogues. I'm not going to get into too much detail here, but the whole idea is right, that there's this, starts with the thesis, and then there are three things that could happen. Skeptic can refuse to grant any premises, and then the dialogue stops. Or skeptic immediately from the start comes up with what Lakatos calls a global counterexample, right? Which is a situation where the uh, initial premises are true, but then the conclusion, which is the theorem that has already been stated, is false. That's a global counterexample, end of the story. But if a skeptic grants the premises, then prover can move to the first inferential step. And then there are three responses by skeptic, as I already mentioned. One is the, what I call the no move, it's just approval. I have no objections. You may carry on. Then there is the why question. It's like, why, what happened here in this step? It's not that I have a count example. It's not that I think it's wrong. I'm just not seeing how this follows yet. And then a response to that is to break the step down into other steps to make it clearer. But then there can also be a local counterexample, again, Lakatos' terminology, to, so a counterexample to that particular inferential step. And in that case, a uh, prover has to withdraw that particular step or modify it by doing, for example, what Lakatos calls lemma incorporation, among other things. So <laughs> this, this progresses in, like in, in this iterative way until either the conclusion, P arrives at the conclusion, and a skeptic accepts it, so it worked out for prover. But if there are too many objections, if it's really, you know, skeptic is really not convinced, then maybe prover will give up on the proof. Okay? So that's the, the, the general model. 
Okay, so now I still have some 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah I'll probably be even less than that. So now I, I get to talk about prover and skeptics and mathematical practice. And this draws on the very last chapter of the book, which I uh, often say I think it might be my favorite of the whole book because that's where the whole thing comes to life, right? Since I'm, as I said, I'm a, a pragmatist and I want to see my theories, my philosophical theories, my philosophical accounts, latching on to things that people actually do, people out there in the world. And as it happens, I think that uh, my story uh, explains not everything, but a lot of what's going on in mathematics research, okay? And today at the, at the expert workshop in the afternoon, some of my critics were saying, well, you capture a lot of what goes on in mathematics, but not everything. And I said, yeah, I know. I never really, I, I think nobody could capture everything, but, uh, <laughs> but and, and then of course, we, what we're doing is we're doing this Lacatosian thing that I say, look, here's my claim. And they're like, yes, but here's a counterexample that doesn't fit your story. And then, you know, I can try to improve it. And that's exactly, that's the game we play, right? And it's, it's, it's really, I, at least I find, you know, I've been doing philosophy more for almost 30 years. I still enjoy it very much. Okay, so uh, what I'll focus on here is how my, my prover skeptic dialogues, they give a good account of what happens in peer review and mathematics. Right? So for, a, I don't know if everybody here is an academic, maybe not, so just, there's just this general idea that uh, when you, um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an academic, you write a paper, you make a claim, right? you produce some results for the world, this is then uh, checked by peers, by other academics of your field, who then will say whether you know, it's good science what you have there, right? if, it's, if it's solid or not. And if it is, then typically for journals, right, there's this idea of peer-reviewed journals, is that you send it off to the journal, the editor sends it to referees who presumably are experts on the topic and then can say whether it's good stuff or not. And in philosophy, for example, if, you, if it's bad, if the referees think, well, I'm not, I don't know, I don't like it, there's a mistake, or it's superficial, it's misguided, it's not interesting, then then this, the, the referee says, don't publish it, right? So then the editor doesn't publish. In mathematics, it works a bit quite, quite differently. I'm gonna talk about this in a minute. But so the idea of peer review is, is you know, everywhere in academia, right? It's not specific to mathematics, it's not specific to philosophy, but I'm talking in particular about peer review in mathematics. And the interesting thing is that, of course, peer review uh, is often talked about in the context of publications of journals, but actually happens also informally, right? People are checking each other's works constantly, right? So also in informal ways. So one thing that happens in philosophy is that sometimes, or in other fields as well, uh, you upload a, a paper that hasn't, you haven't yet, hasn't been published, hasn't been sent to, to a journal, but you just put it like, you know, in a, in a depository somewhere and then somebody reads it and send, sends you comments, or else, you know, you give talks, Right? We very often go to places and we give talks and then people say, well, but look, you know, I don't think this really works. This is also a form of peer review, but then more informal, okay? But so my general claim is that prover and skeptics, right, the, those supposedly fictive characters that I had, in fact, they are not fictive only. They also are embodied in peer review practice and mathematics in particular, both formally for journals, but also informally, for example, uh, mathematics, uh, there's a lot of uh, online collaboration in mathematics. So there's, for example, Math Overflow. There are many platforms where mathematicians meet, as it were. And in fact, uh, many blogs, you know, that was really fun in the kind of the 2010s. There was a lot of really fun activity in, uh, in uh, blogs. And then sadly, blogs are not as prominent as they used to be. But I think, you know, uh, it's really very nice to see because there's like very much this kind of communal way of doing mathematics. Uh, so this is, for example, this is just an example of uh, some random paper that I found. Like, so the interesting thing is like all the, the annotations, right? So when, you know, if you're a mathematician and you're reading a paper, either it's already been published or not, you know, typically people are just writing things in the margin and very often like, question marks, because these are like the why questions, but how does this follow, right? So this is this, this kind of very bodily engagement. 
And it's just some observations. I, maybe I'll start with the bottom one. So mathematics is a, a related field, which includes uh, some uh, theoretical physics, but also computer science and other kind of fields in that area. Uh, they, they have this thing called archive, which is this wonderful thing that is, a, is a, 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 which hosts the uh, publication of preprints. And so what people do in these areas is they write a paper, they upload it to archive. And there are some criteria, right? It's not like anyone can just send whatever, but mostly it's just this open depository of papers. And that's what really, you know, this is where papers are read and seen in mathematics, not so much in journals. We were just talking about this over lunch with Timothy Gowers today, who was one of my, one of the, uh, speakers at the workshop today. So this is, this is very different from philosophy. So for those of you philosophers here, you know, we have a very different way of organizing the, the, this collective production of knowledge in, in philosophy with respect to mathematics. And the other thing that's interesting is that mathematical paper is typically refereed by only one expert. In philosophy, we tend to have at least two, if not more. And the other thing is that the process is typically not double anonymous. So we, in philosophy, we try to, at least the, the, let's say in the better journals, right, you, you really want uh, the referees not to know who the author is, to precisely to kind of counter issues having to do with reputation, pedigree, right? So that the paper is really judged on, only on its merits. This doesn't happen in mathematics. There's no such thing as anonymous refereeing in mathematics. Even before archive, this wasn't done. But certainly now with archive, all the papers are already there. Okay, so this is some, some of the features of... Uh, so what happens when uh, 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 a reviewer engages with a paper, either informally or formally? So a referee checks for what uh, can be described as the checkability of the proof by the relevant aspect, experts. What does that mean? When a referee, a reviewer, is checking the a proof in a, in, a, in a mathematical paper for the correctness of the proof, it's not, she's not only thinking about whether she personally understands the proof, but also if other members of the relevant community would also understand the proof, would also be able to check the proof, run through the proof. So it's very communal already at this level. So she not only comments on the parts that she personally cannot follow, but also the parts that she believes will be harder, hard for others in the community to follow. And this is where then she says, hey, you need more details here. You need to make the proof more perspicuous here for the intended audience of the proof, which is the relevant mathematical community. Okay? And uh, the, the thought is that a large majority of the relevant experts, right, of the specialized field in question, should be able to validate the proof, right, to go through the proof, understand the proof, see if it's correct within a reasonable amount of time. Right? So this is the ideal. So the skeptic checks for checkability, so not just for whether it's convincing for skeptic alone, but also for the larger community. And this idea of checkability is an idea that I borrow from Lena Anderson, who's a researcher in philosophy and mathematical practice. Also, she does quite a lot of work on mathematics education. So she, she, she introduced this idea. She has this really nice paper about peer review in mathematics. Uh, which was published, I think, in Synthesia in 2018. And uh, when she was uh, writing this paper, we met at a conference, and she said, wow, you know, your idea of the prover skeptic model really fits well with, she did this empirical uh, work where she interviewed mathematicians on their refereeing practices. And she said, what, what you're describing fits very, very well the results of my interviews. And then she, she writes this, right? very much referring to, to the prover skeptic model, which it was before the book was published, but it was already published in a few papers. And then she says the following, right? this idea that the proof is a set, mathematical proof is essentially dialogical. She says, contained in the published proof are the author's responses to the responses of this voice, and this voice is the referee's voice, which represents the whole sub-community, it's not just the referee's voice, to the author. In this sense, the proof can be said to consist in a dialogue between the relevant community and the author. This suggests that we speak of a published mathematical proof as a piece of discourse with the relevant audience, not only as a piece of, dis piece of discourse aimed at that audience. So it's well, again kind of this Lakatosian idea of the co-creation of mathematical knowledge by means of these dialogical interactions. 
Right? And she says this very much um, is very much confirmed by the kind of work that she, she has done. So the end result, what you see, very often it's already a response to what th these objections that have been or these comments that have been formulated either in the context of formal peer review but also informally just the feedback received from colleagues, right? So mathematicians go to conferences or meetings or seminars and they present some ideas and then they get feedback on this. So, so that's why it's very communal and dialogical from the start. And then I'll fi uh, finish with, a, with a, an anecdote from real life case of prover and skeptics interacting in this interesting way. And this was Andrew Wiles' proof of Fermat's last theorem, which I think one could say it was the most bombastic result in mathematics of the last 40 years. Would you say that, Tim? Yeah, OK. So, so very bombastic. But what happened was, so here's the thing. Right? So Wiles was working on his own for many years on this uh, proving Fermat's last theorem, right? which is something that Fermat wrote in the 18th century. Well, you know, I have this wonderful theorem. I have a proof of this, but I don't have space to write, so it will be for some other time. And then for centuries, people were trying to prove Fermat's last theorem and couldn't find, a, even though it's easy to state the theorem, but finding a proof was very hard. And then uh, Wiles worked on it on his own for a long time, and he went to this conference and was presenting results on the board, and then very bombastically at the end, you know, said QUD, right? what was to be dem demonstrated, and it was from us last year, and people in the audience were like, wow, what happened here? Okay, I'm simplifying things, but, but then what happened was that uh, uh, while sent this mammoth proof, very, very long, to a very prestigious journal, and what the editor of the journal did, we uh, divided the proof in six parts and sent each of the six parts to different referees. It was a long <laughs> proof, it was complicated. One of these referees was, was a mathematician in Princeton called Nick Katz. So that, so the proof, his part of the proof was sent to him, and this is like a, a, an account from a journalistic piece of what happened. So I read, so for two months, Katz and a French colleague, Luc Illusi, scrutinized every logical step in Katz's section of the proof. By the way, it's not all mathematical proofs that are checked line by line, but this was, of course, a very high-profile result. So then everything had to check, okay? So they were checking each step. From time to time, they would come across a line of reasoning they couldn't follow. Katz would email Wiles, who would provide a fix. Right? So it's the skeptic saying, wait, what's happening here? I didn't understand. But in late August, Wiles offered an explanation that didn't satisfy the two reviewers. And when Wiles took a closer look, he saw that Katz had found a crack in the mathematical scaffolding. Very dramatic. At first, a repair seemed straightforward. But as Wiles picked at the crack, pieces of the structure began falling apart. And it turned out it was a very serious mistake, which couldn't be easily fixed. And then Wiles had to work on this for a whole year together with a, with a colleague, Richard Taylor, so that they finally found a solution for that problem, and then the proof was then considered to be correct by the whole mathematical community. So there's very much the prover skeptic dialogue going on here, right? emailing each other and, and asking for clarifications and, 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 and uh, to make the proof more perspicuous, and then finding a mistake. Right? So they were collaborating in, by being adversarial. So I, my claim is, of course, this is one case. Right? So I must say, oh, it's cherry picked. But I, I think that you know, there are many other, in, you know, this is kind of, is very representative of how mathematics, research in mathematics is done, okay? So that's, uh, that takes me to my conclusions. Just to summarize some of the main points I argued for. So the gist of the whole story is that deduction is at once oral and written. I've mostly argued for the oral part. I didn't focus much on the written part, but uh, that's important to keep in mind. Deduction has these dialogical roots, which I claim are still very present in theories and in practices of deduction. I spent a whole book to argue for that. But also there, there are these non-dialogical features in these practices. For example, mo proofs often look like monologues. There's the very important role of writing, right, of the written medium in mathematical research. Uh, the account highlights, right, so what I mentioned at the beginning, the deeply human and social nature of deduction and as embedded in actual human practices. 
and uh, it allows uh, this dialogical conception allows for a unification of different approaches and perspectives, right? So I have this one story where different pieces of the puzzle kind of fit in one thing, and that's the idea of synthetic philosophy. I think that they, they at least, right? Uh, the idea was that it would shed new light on a number of open questions, both in philosophy of logic, philosophy of mathematics, and so I think that taken together, right, so it's not like individually each of these applications of the dialogical idea may not, of course, seal the deal, but if you look at it taken together, I think that then you have a story that is quite convincing, I hope. <coughs> but please read the book and see. <laughs> At least the, the selectors thought it was convincing, I suppose, so that's, uh, yeah. <laughs> and I just want to finish with uh, some words of thanks. It's not going to be a long Oscar speech or anything like that. Just thank the people who have uh, helped me in different ways. First of all, the, <coughs> I'm sorry, the funding agencies that gave me money to do this research, the Dutch Research Council and the European Research Council. Sorry, let me... <coughs> <coughs> I almost made it through the whole talk. <coughs> so the Roots of Deduction team in Groningen who was working with me on this project, Matthew Duncan, Leon Herding, and Ron French, <coughs> former colleagues at the University of Groningen, current colleagues at the VU, and also colleagues all around the world who contributed in various ways because, you know, I practice what I preach. I'm very dialogical. I'm always kind of trying to engage people in, you know, criticizing me and coming up with ideas on how things could be even better. My um, Cambridge University Press for publishing the book, and especially my editor, Hilary Gasking. My nominators to the Lactose Award, one of whom is here, Tim. The other two were not, but thank you. Also, of course, the Lazis Foundation for making all this possible, the Lakatos Award Management Committee, especially Roman Frigg, who couldn't be here, Hasek Chang, and also Tom. Where's Tom? There's Tom, thank you. And then finally, on the personal front, the people were sitting there, my daughters, Maria and Sophie, my mother, Maria, who came specially from Brazil for this, and my partner, Kilian. And of course, thank you all for coming here, and you know, I look forward to talking more to you about the book. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katharina, for a wonderful slice of your book. Uh, if you would, uh, yeah, you can either sit or stand. As no, you I'll stand, I'll stand. I'm yeah. just too energetic. We have until 7.15 for questions and answers, so not much time, but let's see what we can fit in. Yes, go ahead, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, it's, but for the others, probably better if you have used the mic. Yeah, thanks for the, for the talk. Um, so I found the material on the origins, the sort of Athenian part, very interesting. Um, oh, surprisingly, given your interests. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess uh, as someone who's not really an expert, I would have imagined that the capacity for deductive reasoning would somehow be a, a human universal. But the story you gave was interesting because it, it gives an account where deductive reasoning arises in a particular social and cultural network, one that you might think was quite specific and even unique to the context you, you gestured at. So I wondered if, and I'm, I've not read the book yet, but I wonder if you could maybe take us through some cross-cultural evidence um, yes. and the extent to which, so what were the sort of preconditions for this dialogic right. um, capacity to arise? To what extent was it unique to the, to the origin story you, you gave, because I guess it's quite revisionary, because I think many people might think deductive reasoning is this, this universal, but the account you give really seems to require certain quite specific preconditions, and I wonder how that matches up to the sort of emergence of, of dialogic yes. reasoning else, elsewhere, you understand that. So let me start with the idea that uh, deductive reasoning would be a human universal. It is not. <clears throat> and anyone who has been keeping up with the research on the psychology of reasoning since the 1960s would know, I mean, it would be very strange for it to be a human universal if you look at how bad people do 
in these reasoning tasks. And of course you can say, oh, it's the experimental setting, all this. But I mean, the whole story of the book is that deductive reasoning is a cognitive oddity. It's, there's no uh, evolutionary grounding. There's no Kantian, you know, conditions of thought as such. No, this is all, I argue against all this in the book. And what I say is exactly that uh, deductive reasoning is, cu is cultural, right? It's a cultural, it's a result of cultural processes. So you got that uh, correct. And what I do in the book is also I talk about, briefly, I talk about two other ancient traditions, Chinese, uh, the Chinese intellectual tradition and the Indian intellectual tradition. And what I say <coughs> is that you, uh, what you see in those traditions is that there is no emergency of deductive reasoning as you had in Greece, which is not to say that, oh, the Greeks are much better. No, it's just different. Right? If anything, the Indian philosophers were much more, like talking about much more abstract topics, you know, and with very sophisticated theories of argumentation, but the focus was just different, okay? And here I'm really drawing on work by Jeffrey Lloyd and Ravio Nats and other historians. So uh, Jeffrey Lloyd in particular compares a lot with the Chinese, uh, you know, the development in, in ancient Greek mathematics and in Chinese mathematics, and he, he's the one who claims that, well, you know, in, in Greece, in ancient Athens, there was democracy, so that's why you got deduction. In China, you didn't have democracy, so you don't get deduction. That's oversimplified, and then I have some nuances to that in the book, but generally, that's, that would be one interesting contrast. Because deduction as such, you know, understand this kind of this Euclidean way, is unique to, you know, is, is, is a unique event. And you see, I mentioned this briefly in the afternoon, that there is, uh, in, in Chinese mathematics, in, Later, much later, when they're commenting on the can canonical works in the tradition, you start seeing something that looks like Euclidean proofs, but not before. So in that sense, it's, you know, I can tell you more, but, you know, there is a little bit of cross-cultural comparison in the book as well. Question here, please. So I, I really like the cooperative aspect, because um, uh, that's something that, uh, broad, more broadly, thinking about reasoning is very central to the way that we do philosophy and is coming under attack because it seems like it's old-fashioned and masculine and yeah. um, n not aimed at truth but aimed at proving the other person wrong. And, yeah, and scoring points, exactly. right? Exactly, yeah. and of course it can degenerate into all of that, but you're bringing out how, understood cooperatively, what people now call an adversarial collaboration, it's absolutely central to one way of discovering truth. But I wonder if you can <laughs> enlarge on that, and particularly, do you think that's tied to deduction specifically and this thing of like, yes, no answers and proving the other wrong or is it part of a broader framework about it? No, I th uh, adversary collaboration is much, a much more general idea and in fact it's, uh, for example, Daniel Kahneman, right, the psychologist, has been talking about this for, for quite a few years now. So the way it works and say, in, you know, in the social sciences is that you have two people who uh, disagree, uh, there's some, some discussion that they have some disagreement uh, or something empirical, and then they say, hey, you know what we're going to do? We're going to get together and design an experiment that we both agree is going to shed new light on our disagreement. And they actually do this together, and then eventually they write a paper together. And you can even have somebody who's like, serves as the kind of arbiter, the judge involved, and also becomes a co-author. And this is doesn't, it's not deductive, right? I mean, it's, it has to do with a running experiments and how you interpret results of experiments. I think in philosophy there's also quite a lot of that uh, going on. I have this paper called Two Types of Refutation in Philosophy where I talk about this kind of Socratic elenchus and then uh, and also about Lakatos. It's a recent paper appeared last year in the Journal of Argu Argumentation. So if you're interested in the kind of a metaphilosophical implications, there's, I say a little bit of there. But I also think that philosophy practice in this kind of very, like just thinking of counterexamples and objections can also lead to very sterile ways of engaging in inquiry. So I certainly don't want to say that, you know, we should always be doing this. So one thing that I think is very important in uh, philosophical practice is, you know, ch charitable interpretations and really trying to listen and understand what is this person really, really saying and then try to think of potential objections or, so in that sense I, I, I agree, right, that there's this idea of, uh, and, and it's, it can be, a, you know, it, it definitely is an important part of many different collective forms of inquiry in different disciplines, but it can also become overdone. And I think often in philosophy it does, and we should watch out for that. 
two questions, one and two. One in the front first. Can uh, AI ah. bots uh, do this sort Sorry, of dialogical process? What do you mean? Can artificial intelligence bots chat GTP? Well, a lot of, uh, a lot of these, these protocols, these algorithms are very much based on, uh, oh, okay, you say if chat, chat, chat GTP can do this. Yes, because right in a way, they're just mimicking what other people do. If they get enough input from, you know, lots of, say, if you feed a lot of mathematical papers into them, they'll start, the, 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 the black box will start to kind of pick up patterns of how argumentation works, and they can mimic that to some extent. But whether they're, you know, then you get into discussions about the philosophy of AI. Are they really kind of in dialogue with each other or just imitating, right? But another question, I don't know if this is, You've also had this in mind, but one thing that I discuss also in the book is that in already in the recent decades, there's been a lot of use of computers, of digital methods in mathematics. And then there's the question of like, you know, computer assisted proofs or even computer generated proofs, to what extent my model fits that story or not. And then the long, the short rest is that it doesn't completely fit, but that's not a problem for what I'm arguing for in the book as a whole. I can give a longer answer over the reception or something, just in the interest of time. We have time for one more question from the front row, so I'm sorry. Yeah, um, I, I, see, I never thought before that there would be a difference between natural philosophy and human philosophy. I mean, if, if they're out of Kelto, we're not going to survive, and I, you know, I think that's the situation yeah. that we're in now. So I'm surprised that you've come up with a new term that's that you call synthetic, which, uh -huh. which implies that there, that you've discovered something new which I have not yet grasped. Um, but I do want, uh, uh, um, the, the, uh, and also I thought you've ref referred to the necessary truth preservation as, as one of the criteria, one of the things that you uh, needs to be endorsed or somehow validated. Whereas I, th I always thought that it was the necessary life preservation. And I thought the natural philosophy of life is to sustain life on Earth until its finite end, which only our species knows is finite. And if we, don't, you know, if we, if we haven't understood our philosophy, uh, you know, I mean, the whole notion of critique, Kant's critique of all reason, you know, the groundwork of all morals, uh, being the other species that, that unconsciously evolved us as the conscious species, uh, since that's been, Hegel just dismissed that as, as you seem to be doing, um, uh, 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 then h how then do we reground ourselves mm -hmm. to prevent ourselves from being you know, fried in the next few yes. years? Uh, there's a lot to unpack here. I wish I had an answer. I wish my book could actually address, of course, the biggest existential threat for humans now, which is, of course, the impeding climate, climate uh, uh, disaster. I'm sorry to disappoint you, I don't have an answer to that. What I was trying to do in the book, but well, first of all, the, the idea of necessary truth preservation is a property of deductive arguments. Right? And in a way, it's very much the question is, what, what does it do for us? So in a way, I'm also talking about this in the book. And I'm saying that in a way, deductive arguments, deductive reasoning is not central to human life. So in a way, I'm kind of agreeing with you, right? I'm saying it's really you know, confined to niches of specialists because most of what we do out there, you know, as we go about in life, is we're doing non-monotonic reasoning. We're doing reasoning on the basis of regularities. We're just kind of, we don't need necessary truth preservation. It's, it's, it's an oddity. So in that sense, I guess, you know, I'm agreeing with you in some <laughs> sense or another because I'm saying the range of application of deductive reasoning is quite small. I think we can fit yeah. in one last quick question, the lady in the fourth row. No, just wait for the mic because otherwise other people don't hear. Yeah, I know from experience, even if I hear it, others yeah. don't hear it and it's a problem. I wondered if you could say something more about rational reconstruction. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Yes, because of course that's kind of the metaphilosophical question, right? That's very much looming in the background. So. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll say here, and I know I have some uh, fellow Carnapians in the audience, <laughs> kind of my general take here is that it's something like Carnapian explication, right? In the sense that it's like a, uh, Carnap also uses the term rational reconstruction. So it's the idea that you're kind of, in a way, formulating like a, a 
new concept, but it's not entirely new because you're drawing on something that's already there. And you just hope that this is going to be fruitful in the sense of being illuminating. So I'm not you know, committed to it really being the way things are. Also, I'm an anti-essentialist about stuff anyway. But the point being is it's meant to be um, fruitful in the sense that it kind of sheds light on, you know. So in that sense, it's, it, I, don't, I don't need for it to be exactly as things are in these practices. If insofar as it puts things in a different perspective and kind of shows connections, right? So Matthew today in, the, in his presentation at the workshop, he said, well, there are these different things that I had worked on. I hadn't seen that they were connected until I read your book and then I saw the connections between them. Yes, that's what I want, right? So this idea of being fruitful, being illuminating, and it doesn't need to be something that, you know, it's nothing like necessary and sufficient conditions for something to count as F, no. It's just meant as a kind of, let's call it heuristic, almost a, it's a term that I, you like, remember, the heuristic device, you know, to help you see things in a different light and perhaps see connections where you would otherwise not see. So that's very much the gist of it. And, you know, this idea allowed me to bring research from different quarters together and show how they're connected. So in that sense, it's the, the goal of the rational reconstruction. Thank you. I'm sure we could go on for much longer, but the reception is waiting. There's free champagne, wonderful food, and <laughs> we will be presenting the actual award. So uh, if you don't know, Tom, can you? It's the fifth floor of the old building, right? So we just walk with you. If you don't know where that is, please grab on to someone who seems to know where they're going. It's not far, it's the, uh, one of the main LSC buildings. And thank you once again for a wonderful lecture, Katarina. Thank you. And thank you all for being here.